Hey, everyone. Welcome back to 51%'s Crypto Research Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Shaughnessy. Today, I'm sharing one of my favorite conversations to date. I had Consensus's Alpine spoke on, the team that's focused on token design and engineering, for a very engaging conversation. I was joined by Gregory Rocco and Jacob Leish, both token engineers at Alpine. We covered a lot in this episode, ranging from how to actually design utility tokens, which projects don't need a token, and the actual use cases for utility tokens. We then go on to why we don't need the majority of the tokens we have today. The two share their views on the token designs of major projects such as Basic Attention Token, MakerDAO, and ZeroX, three prominent projects. We also discuss how the Alpine team works with enterprises to design tokens for enterprise use cases. We conclude with a great conversation on designing actual governance and utility tokens and doomsday scenarios surrounding how decentralized applications and smart contracts will always be subject to the decisions of the base protocol, such as Ethereum or EOS, so it's worth designing on a decentralized platform. As an aside, for the next 24 hours, our podcast listeners can use promo code TOKEN on 51pct.io to get 20% off any subscription using this coupon code. Users can access our institutional crypto research read by top funds such as Multicoin and Arca and major banks such as Oppenheimer. The coupon code is TOKEN. With that, here's my conversation with Rocco and Jacob. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, I have on Rocco and Jacob Leish, both token engineers slash token designers at Consensus under the Alpine Spoke. How's it going, guys? Oh, hey, how's it going, Tom? Thanks for having us on. Yeah, it's it's going well. How about yourself? Good. Thanks, guys. So let's start with uh, Rocco. Let's start with you. How did you get started in crypto? And uh, tell us a bit about your background. Sure. So uh, crypto started a couple of years ago when I first purchased Bitcoin off of Coinbase. Uh, eventually started uh, doing light trades, nothing too major. And then um, uh, found my way to a company called InvestFeed. Um, ran their community and became editor chief for them for a while. So I was writing articles, but had like a little mini newsroom there. Uh, then I started writing for other publications like Bitcoinist and CCN. Uh, started working with companies on communication strategy, which eventually evolved into mechanism design. And then eventually um, joined Consensus under Token Foundry in particular, uh, because Jacob here was a friend of mine who was the, over there and uh, definitely thought I could add value to, to his team at the time. That's awesome. Jacob, how about uh, you and your background? Yeah, so my background is a little bit more all over the place. I originally came from startups and then went to Big Bad Banking with JP Morgan, where I actually discovered blockchain during that time. I'm one of those tragic cases that had a competitive Magic the Gathering friend that told me about Bitcoin back in like 2010 and told him he was an idiot. Um, And then during my time at JP Morgan, I just started reading white papers and got really consumed about it with my background in economics and math. I started looking at the actual details and the incentive structures. And then I decided to yellow out of JP Morgan, which landed me at Consensus um, just through networking, found a few people and they said I should come work for them. And mainly, like nothing against JP Morgan, I think they're doing great work there, especially in blockchain, but they just move too slowly because they're a heavily regulated entity. And then I've been at Consensus and Alpine for almost a year now. That's that's interesting. Jacob, I think we're going to be friends because I also played Magic the Gathering growing up, and I also left a bank for crypto full time. So we're basically the same person. <laughs> same, same. So let's get into, you guys focus a lot on token design. I came across both of you when I was reading the EOS report that Consensus put out with White Block. I also had the White Block team on the podcast. It's an episode worth listening to. So let's go into token design. Um, You know, what's the main methodologies that you guys look for um, when designing tokens? Yeah, so we, me specifically, I'm extremely pragmatic. Um, I try to see both sides of things. and. One of the biggest things is cutting away all the chaff from last year and all the hype. We, we sit down with projects and we first look at it from a business opportunity. So forget blockchain, forget decentralization. Is what you're working on a good business idea? Or if you're an existing business, are you making money and do you have users? Because if you don't have anyone that's going to go in your network, it doesn't really matter. So if we cross that bridge and determine they're actually competent and capable from a business perspective, Then we start looking at does distributed technology or blockchain even make sense? And if it makes sense, do you need a digital asset on top of it, whether that's a token, that's a security, a utility, whatever. But we take a very holistic approach and look at it from that lens because 
we need to understand if a project is willing to give up control. What things do they need to control? What is their secret sauce that they won't like share with the world? And if they keep everything privatized, then blockchain in many instances won't make sense. It's it's kind of like uh, does your does your dog food business need an adversarial environment? Like honestly, it's 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 a lot of it came from the 2017 hype where you know people were raising for tokens left and right and just slapping a token onto anything. Um, but uh, the approach we take, and we we're very proud of, uh, kind of from the customer development standpoint, and as Jacob mentioned, it's that kind of three step process where do you a have a business, <laughs> which is always the first step in this before you even think about or utter the word blockchain. Second, do you actually need a blockchain? Like I said, third, do you even need a token? Which each are merit their own long discussions. That's interesting. So let's take let's go into those three parts. I, I'm wondering at a high level, you know, the the teams or the projects that approach you guys, what are the percentages? that step one, have a business, then step two, need a blockchain, and then step three, actually need a token. I'm assuming you know, all these percentages multiplied together is, a, is probably a small number. Yeah, we, we're still dealing with a bunch of people that are just throwing spaghetti at the wall because they want to raise $50 million for their marinara sauce on the blockchain. But <laughs> <laughs> oftentimes, um, it is getting better. And we have our team specifically at Alpine, we are starting to focus on enterprises more. And the reason is not because we hate startups. We want to offer our services more open source and free to startups and then engage with them once they've solved their base level market market fit. And then with enterprises, just being brutally honest, they have money and they have users. So they've already solved two of the starting points of if you need blockchain. But generally... I would say, you know, if we talk to 10 projects or clients, potential clients, maybe five have a good use case for blockchain or decentralized technology. And then I'd say maybe one or two have a legitimate use case for a digital asset. That being said, we can sometimes guide them more or less towards or away those assets. I know that's a little hand wavy. And part of also that what we do is uh, that's the beauty of, of kind of us and the work that we do is um, the fact that it's not always us consulting on like you need blockchain or trying to force the fit or trying to force the fit for the token. More often than not, as Jake mentioned, as we kind of scale down the numbers from those who have a business case, those who need a blockchain, you've kind of sliced it. And then those who need a token, you slice it again. A lot of what we do actually is saying the opposite. Hey, don't use blockchain here. Hey, don't use a token here because neither of which makes sense. But for the rare cases that it does, it's, quite interesting but as we mentioned yeah we're, we're definitely not here to kind of pedal it but rather to have these companies think a, a little bit better about their model and when they actually need a blockchain and as jake also mentioned uh, the enterprise side they have the resource to deploy to, to deploy at it and test it out to see if it works in their environments they already solve the customer problem because they already have large platforms with many users that, that's and, super interesting sorry go ahead jacob yeah and just one more thing is the way i view this and i know a lot of people might disagree with me which is fine um, we can fight about it on crypto Twitter. But the the reality is that the internet started as a bunch of private intranets. And then IBM and Microsoft were like, hey, how do we talk to each other? So they started putting these strands out that were more public. And that's what became this internet that everyone uses. And I, I strongly feel blockchain is going to be the same. You're going to see a bunch of enterprises nickel and diming and using it in like certain facets. But then when a bank needs to share some data publicly in a trust trustless way with other banks, those strands will eventually form what will become the base level for a lot of the public blockchains that eventually give us all these great apps in the future. That's interesting. So I want to talk about the extremes of you know the one or two companies where it does make sense to have a token. But before we get there, uh, you guys brought up a good point about the enterprises. I mean, do you guys, when you consult with these enterprise customers, I mean, do they need tokens for their use cases or is it more a situation where you're convincing them or helping them use blockchain without a token since they have the funding and they have the users? So that's, that, this is actually one of my favorite parts of the space and which is what has kept me so interested is we've been working with a, an e-commerce company recently and I apologize to, to obfuscate names here, but basically <clears throat> when we first came in, they didn't even know what they didn't know. And they said, listen, even if you sell us on blockchain, we can't even enter into a legal agreement because we put this in front of the legal team and they themselves would say, what the hell's a blockchain? And then even if we educate the legal team, 
the board of directors is going to look at this and go glassy eyed and be like, we don't even know what this is either. So the first step is, like I've mentioned before, is like really just educating them, very conversational, and then starting to pick apart where blockchain might work. And with this particular client, what we proposed to them is we gave them this utopic blue sky vision of 10 years down the road, if they made an e-commerce meta platform where it was an insighted marketplace. And we're like, listen, and I'll use Amazon because they're a real world example of someone that's moving in this uh, direction already, where Amazon used to sell books. Then they were like, what else do people buy that like books? Well, they like movies and music. Okay. Well, we have some excess capacity. Could we let other people sell books, movies, and music? So they created a marketplace. Then they were like, well, we need logistics providers. Well, we can provide the logistics. Well, why can't we also use UPS and FedEx and all the others? Well, what about these last mile deliveries? So they created a marketplace there. Then they created a marketplace for excess compute, which turned into AWS. And if you keep doing this for finance, for logistics, for things like that, eventually what you get is this multi-sided marketplace. The only thing that would need to happen next is you have to give up control. You have to stop taking rent. And that's a really hard pill to swallow with some clients because they're like, well, wait, my money. I make all my money off my website. What we tell them, though, is in 10 years, if this becomes a shared community resource where everyone's pooling all of those assets together, whether that's suppliers, logistics providers, financiers, etc., what that does is create something that's much of a much higher value. And our selling point is, if you were to tokenize this to power this ecosystem, yes, you might lose a billion dollars of market cap. But if you have 20% of this network that powers global e-commerce, that would be worth, let's call it $10 billion and is an appreciating balance or asset on your balance sheet. So what we have to do is get these enterprises to really be okay with cre- uh, destructive innovation. Netflix is a perfect example of someone that said, you know, streaming is going to be the future. We need to kill our DVD mail order business. And people thought they were crazy. They Their stock suffered very heavily for a couple of years. And now they're laughing all the way to the bank. That's super, super interesting. And two points there. I always laugh at not people in crypto or tech like our audience here, but a lot of people don't even realize that Amazon is has AWS, the largest cloud, is the largest largest cloud company in the world. And the other point you brought up, which was awesome, is the just the shared infrastructure idea of what you can do when you share resources like wireless towers, fiber, you know, name your name your pick there. But just to go into this a little bit more on the token for enterprises, I mean what exactly would this look like for enterprises using a token? Is this something like Amazon releasing AWS token, or where exactly would like a token fit in in your in your example that we just discussed? It would primarily so we've I'll let Rocco take this after I just give the intro, but generally not talking about security tokens and not talking about NFTs, non fungible tokens like the Crypto Kitties, talking about utility or consumer tokens. They serve very few purposes. And generally, we, if you're designing a network, we try to guide most clients. Again, this is not a fit-all solution. We try to guide them towards a work token. And a work token is what lets you provide goods or services to the network. And you do that through staking most often, where you put something up as collateral to basically not to guarantee that you're not going to be a jerk. And Rocco can fill out a little bit more of that. Yeah, and um, if, if you're if you're speaking more on the enterprise side, like we've designed kind of these marketplaces, um, and tokens in this case can be used almost as a signaling mechanism, uh, as as signs of trust, especially in these cases that might be on permission networks and not public networks. Um, but as Jake mentioned, you know, once you go into the, it, it's a, it's a, it's a very different dynamic designing tokens for enterprise if they even need them. It mostly deals with asset tokenization <clears throat> or signaling mechanisms. But like, as Jake mentioned, public tokens stretch far beyond that. Um, and I'm definitely we can go into that if you'd like on various kind of use cases of tokens. Yeah, please. That'd be great. Yeah, sure. So uh, with our team, we've kind of broken down tokens uh, on the public sphere into four cases. Uh, the first are your payments tokens. So these are, you know, these, these, these were joking around like the 2017, the dog food tokens. Like, we're going to have like the revolutionary currency for dog food. Everyone's going to use it on like pets.com. And so on. And, and then these are your tokens that represent uh, single uh, rebates, they single signal memberships, and they signal uh, their, you know, their, their own form of medium of exchange on whatever platform they're being built for. They're typically not useful and, and are seen to just introduce more friction to these systems. But we could also go into that later. The second base mechanism we think about is um, 
voting. So these are your, your governance tokens, um, which you're hearing more and more about. Um, so if you, uh, cases like zero X cases like Aragon cases like maker, uh, all examples of, um, governance tokens. Uh, third, you have your work tokens, as Jake mentioned, these are your, you know, tokens you put up in, in, as a bond, um, in order to provide work or a service for a network. So in this case, we have projects like live peer in which you're putting up a bond to be a transcoder, uh, in Augur, in which you're, you're putting up a bond to be a Oracle for predictions markets. And in this case gives you kind of access to a discounted cash flow model where you're seeing returns based on um, the work you're providing and how much intra- open interest is on these platforms and how much money is being moved through these platforms. And lastly, you have representative tokens. These are your NFTs, these are your crypto kitties, but these are also your securitized assets. So that's those, yeah, that's a great the- that's a great framework and a great overview. I mean, so it sounds like from what you guys are describing, correct me if I'm wrong, that you kind of you're you're most interested in the work tokens and not so much for payments voting or representative tokens, or or am I getting that wrong? Um, I was actually just talking to someone earlier today at a conference we were at that the you have to really be transformative to make me think that you're going to make that Jake dollars is going to be better than the U.S. dollar. I just I have a hard time believing Jake dollar is so revolutionary that I'm going to give up everything. Now, that being said, very high level companies or entities or consortia that already have network effects, I could see that playing out. So an example would be Apple. They have 800 million credit cards on file due to iTunes and everything else that they do. If they were to make an Apple token and it was supposed to represent a currency or medium of exchange, well, that combined with Apple Pay being accepted at a lot of point of sales, that has a good chance of actually becoming a meaningful currency. But Jake, with Jake's token, like the problem with rolling a new currency is initially it's going to be a liquid. Where the hell can you go to buy it? I have to convert fiat to Ethereum or Bitcoin over to Jake token. The other thing is the volatility. Since it's a new toy, there's not going to be a lot of depth of liquidity there, again, because it's hard to access. So it's going to swing wildly more so than most other crypto assets do. And then it's like relevance. No one's going to care about it if it's just another way to pay, or worst case, it's pigeonholed to only pay for dog food on pets.com. So no, that, that's super interesting. I mean, Jacob, on the on the payments question, though, I mean, a lot of projects have put out their own tokens to pay for some use case in their network, basically just to incentivize and grow a community. I mean, is there a way for projects to release a token while also incentivizing their community? Or, or it, it sounds to me like you think that a lot of these projects are just doing it wrong. And I tend to agree that there's just too many tokens out there. I'm, I'm going to actually step in here and take this one. We, I think we're both in agreement. Um, Jake does have ideas about like kind of the Apple token with that kind of network effect still kind of being somewhat successful. I'm kind of on the completely other side of where I shun all forms of payment tokens. So like people will come to me with like Brave's bat and I'm just like, why are you doing this? You're just adding another layer of friction. The problem, the other problem I see is the fact that like, you know, it starts with Apple instead of a, a, instead of a decentralized network issuing this currency. So like when I think of the God of payments, I'll think of like Bitcoin. Um, Ethereum is a nice close second <laughs> for me, but these are, you know, these are, uh, assets issued by these networks. They're not issued by that, you know, that by that central party or controlling company. Um, and it's, as Jake mentioned, there are so many hurdles to actually go through to, to get these tokens. There's liquidity hurdles, there's accessibility hurdles. And the story I usually tell, um, people when I talk about payment tokens is when I went to Berlin back in September for um, Berlin Blockchain Week, I was with my colleague, Steve. We get off the plane. It's my first time in Berlin. And I haven't been to Europe in a long time, so I didn't have any euros. And I had to use the restroom. So we got to this metro station and they had a restroom. And I'm like, oh, cool. You know, great. I can go to the bathroom now. I got the plane, you know, trying to get used to Berlin. All of a sudden, the restroom charges a dollar to get in or sorry, one euro. And I didn't have this euro. I'm like, oh, crap. How the hell am I going to get this thing? I don't know where I can change my currency. Like, it's kind of annoying to, to search around for that ATM. And thankfully, Steve still had a one year of coin with him. So he kind of traded it to me, so to speak. He sent it to my wallet. And then I used that one euro to access the bathroom. And I'm like, wow, that was, that was a, hor- a horrific experience <laughs> just, to, just to do this, use the simple service. Like, I was ready to run away and find a free bathroom. And I'm like, is this what using a payments token feels like? Is that, this is literally, a sh- uh, excuse my language, a shit coin. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's no, totally. I mean, just to take it a step further, I mean, let's say 
I, I don't, I'm kind of know, I kind of know brave and bad a little bit, not as much as you guys probably do, but let's say that we strip away the bat token and we use, you know, us dollars or Bitcoin or whatever in their network. I mean, aren't we just left with like a normal internet company then? I mean, don't we not have like a decentralized potential platform to, you know, incentivize publishers and content creators to go on the platform? I just, I kind of feel like we can't have crypto companies without tokens in some respects. So then they just become normal internet companies. Well, in this case, where, where, you know, I could still, Brave has millions of users. That might not. I could still use Brave the browser. And all the money that's being passed through publishers to users can now happen with like Ether. Like it doesn't need to happen through through Bat. We're still using a cryptographic token. I guess if you want to consider, Ether can be considered a cryptographic token in its own right, but it's an easier asset to move around. You're not moving this meta asset on top of Ethereum. Now you're just using the base protocol currency. And even if you wanted something pegged to a dollar, just use an existing stable coin. Use DAI. If you, even, if, even if you want to go the crypto collateralized route, there are other options instead of like building these meta tokens and not using the base asset or, or you know, wanting a meta token and going through the hurdles of like making sure the price is stable and not using a stable coin because these, these assets exist. No, no, that, that's super interesting. Just to play devil's advocate, though, I mean, just so that I get the full understanding here. I mean, let's say that Brave did use Bitcoin. I mean, they wouldn't be able to do things, though, like, you know, distribute $5 worth of BAT to every user for free because they wouldn't control the supply or the policy. I mean, do you think by foregoing a token, they do lose some potentially, you know, credible use cases within their own communities or no? Uh, My question, kind of sidestepping that would be, why do they need to? Because no one has control of the Brave browser except for the company Brave. It's a good and point. Also, and also when PayPal was getting users onto PayPal, they didn't pay them in PayPal coins, they paid them in US dollars. And that was a very <laughs> way to get people to start using PayPal and create massive network effects. If Brave said tomorrow, hey, we'll gift you with this much Bitcoin to start using Brave, holy crap, I would start using Brave tomorrow. Uh, but side note, I already use Brave. Uh, but it would be a better incentive for me to actually do so if they were like, hey, we'll give you this in Bitcoin, we'll give you this in Ether just to start using it to, to, to first incentivize me with like this real tangible uh, currency. That's so, I guess, just taking it a step further again, like if Brave were to implement US dollar or Bitcoin, couldn't Chrome just do that more easily? And then like, what's the point of Brave? I mean, other than the ad blocking features and all that. We have a bingo. <laughs> I see where you guys are going with this. So, now- well, and so just again, if we want to noodle on this for a minute, if you wanted to maybe build an extension that was a revenue paid app for Brave, maybe you would want to stake BAT tokens as collateral, but you're paid in Bitcoin or dollars. Again, it's the way we look at this is payment tokens. There's there's usually ones that already exist that are better, but you can repurpose. The t- That's not to say none of these tokens necessarily have to stay as they are. These networks should be living and breathing and dynamic. So you can change the functionality of the token. And listen, I, I love Brave as a browser. I just don't like the token. And I think they could look at it as maybe if they wanted to modularize certain components of the Brave browser, like I said, for extensions, maybe you could collateralize staking that in order to provide that additional service to the Brave ecosystem. That's that's interesting. So are there any projects out there that have a utility token? I know we're going a little off track here, but it's an interesting conversation. Do you guys think that there's any projects out there that have a utility token? that you guys like um, that might be different or you might get pushback on? One I like is Augur, especially because due to the assassination markets and the questionable legality of them, um, they officially gave up control of it by hard forking out the red button so they can no longer turn it off. And being an Oracle or reporter, and you have to stake in order to be that, I think that's one of the best use cases in my personal opinion. Rocco, what about you? Yeah. You got to have one that you like. So here's the weird crossover. We're normally fans of these kind of assets where you put up a bond to provide a service for the network. The one asset that kind of blurs the lines a bit that I'm fascinated with is actually Maker, um, simply because I have my issues with governance tokens. And shout out to Phil Benello from Mickey Guy who put out a post a while ago on Zero Access System where it's like, what's the cost of simply forking something versus acquiring 51% of a vote? Uh, in terms of governance tokens, Maker fascinates me because you can't just fork Maker out because it's tied to this value floor of Dai that's being collateralized and see that's you know all this ether that's being locked up in CDPs to collateralize Dai. 
So it provides this kind of value floor that was kind of unseen before in something like Xerox. It's, it's, it's a weird, it's like a nebulous value floor versus maker that has this, like, here's this, here's all the ether locked up in CDPs. So that's like the one like crossover, I guess, governance token that, that kind of catches my eye. Otherwise it's mostly like looking at work assets, like, like Augur's rep, like live fears token, you know, like where you're taking to become a transcoder. Or I think mainframe is also looking at a work model as well for their system. So these, these are kind of what catch our eyes. Yeah, no, that that's interesting. I mean, everyone that follows me knows I'm a fan of ZeroX and MakerDAO. I put out extensive research reports on both of them. But I think MakerDAO, like, I don't know if I really think about MakerDAO as like a consumer like use case, though. Like I, I feel like that is more easily accessible than, you know, Joe Schmo going online and entering into a collateralized debt position. But but yeah, this, and, and this is why that's and that's why I place a heavy, heavy emphasis on like, does your project even need a token? Um, we're yeah, like we said earlier, we see the consumer facing stuff like, hey, Brave and Bat, Bat doesn't need to exist. You just like keep the system running with Ether or Bitcoin, and for all these payments that they're handling, adds less friction friction to the user, um, and then you also have happy users because they're not dealing with all the hurdles. Um, and whereas when we talk about the, the tokens we like they usually end up in these quote-unquote decentralized systems. Like Jake mentioned, Augur got rid of the big red button. Um, I'm sure LifePeer will do the same. Maker, obviously, is like slowly turning over their governance to, to the stakeholders. I know they recently had their foundation vote. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of the difference now is like thinking about it from the consumer end and these company ends and these decentralized ends. And the other side of that is we also talk about like in these work networks. So let's say you are let's just, you know, using Augur for the sake of an example where Augur as a team can now capture value is building services on top of Augur and capturing that supply side. That's super interesting. So one more question on this going forward. I mean, in my zero X report, I, I put a valuation model out there. I, I know I'll get pushed back on that from people, but I'm trying to push the bounds there. But I also put out a governance roadmap. And my way of thinking there was kind of like, you know, we can't quantify how much control token users have, but the more control users have, I thought, or I think that the more value the token will accrue. So like zero X has a roadmap where they plan to roll out, you know, community veto power where token holders can veto certain things and liquid democracy, which would, you know, be the ultimate voting machine. Do you guys think that tokens with a good governance roadmap where token holders get more control over time would be positive for tokens? Or do you think that that should be embedded like from day one? That's and that's that's where I want to go with this is that I think that kind of stuff, especially if you're building a decentralized protocol, should be embedded since day one. Um, where I think value is mostly captured in zero X's ecosystem is not at the token level. And I appreciate that they're looking at different voting means. I'm, I'm writing about this right now um, with Liquid Democracy. I know they announced at DevConf. I think at DevConf before they really slides about the, liquid, the delegation liquid, liquid democracy side of things. Where I think value is mostly captured in zero X is at the third layer. Like you have. Um, basically, if zero X was the first on the supply side, like the first free layer, they probably would have captured just as much value as someone like Paradex who got bought out, uh, Radar Relay who received investment, DDEX, all these relayers that are capturing all the true value, regardless of the zero X token. Like zero X token also was like originally supposed to be a payments asset too, because they wanted in the hands of everyone, but they you know realized that trading against it on a relayer was just adding friction because you had to acquire zero X to execute these trades. And the other side of the governance aspect that I think goes overlooked, and again, plugging, plugging a little bit that I'm writing about it, um, is that you're also adhering to base protocol governance. So let's say Zero X holds a vote for Zero X tokens to control the protocol and the smart contracts get upgraded. What happens if, and it's it, obviously there's an unlikelihood of it happening, but there is a chance of it happening. Uh, don't necessarily have to point to Ethereum, but can point to other protocols like EOS and the like where... What happens if the contracts that Zero X are deploying that their governance took care of get censored by the governance of the base protocol? So let's say in the theoretical world that Zero X was on top of EOS, what happens if the block producers just simply censor the Zero X contracts and transactions being moved through the Zero X contracts? Does that then render Zero X's governance useless? That's wow, that's yeah, that's really interesting. This is this is probably gonna be my favorite podcast episode so far because of this conversation. <laughs> but you know, it's obvious that you're talking about it now, but I don't know if people really think about the base layer protocol, Ethereum, EOS, building on Bitcoin as impacting the applications that are built up the stack. So, you know, how do you guys think about that? Do you think that people I mean, obviously I know you guys probably have your qualms with EOS, but 
you know, like Augur or Gnosis, like they're built on Ethereum. So you don't ever think that they'll be impacted by changes to Ethereum's protocol? Well, so that's part of our job is, and again, going back to our process just for a moment, one of the things we do is we work through, okay, who's going to be participating in the network? Why are they going to be participating in the network? How do we reward them? But then we also have our little bonus round of, what happens if Jeff Bezos decides to drop $150 billion on your project because he's just having a bad day? He's got a magnifying glass and you're an anthill. He just chooses to be an angry kid. Like, that's probably not going to happen. But what if? And those are, you know, they're usually called madman attacks or kamikaze attacks. And that's usually where we pull out these kinds of ideas is we just throw spaghetti at a wall sometimes. And we're like, what would happen if all of a sudden China throws all of their economic might against Bitcoin? Will they do it? Maybe, maybe not. But it opens up some of these edge cases and allows us to think about those things. And that's also a lot of fun because you sit here and think of doomsday scenarios. <laughs> yeah. And then like one of the more realistic vectors is that case of like, what if the base protocol they're building on is quite weak? How easy is it to get censored? Obviously, they can move shop and be like, Okay, like we, we love the shopping mall analogy. Like, you know, they're the store in the shopping mall. The shopping mall is the base protocol. Uh, each have their own distinct value flows. So the mall can be valued different than the store inside. But the store, obviously, the brand you recognize can be built across different chains. So, like, I, I think Bancor did this where they had like bonding curves for ETH and now they have bonding curves for EOS. So, what, and, and as Jake mentioned, the base thing we're getting at here is like part of our job is <laughs> besides the man man attacks, what are all the attack vectors? And obviously, base pro- protocol governance is an attack vector for any system that builds governance on top of the base protocol, especially governance tokens. No, that's that's interesting. I don't think people talk enough about it. So let's let's do a comparison here. Let's say that MakerDAO was built on EOS. Like you could obviously have more transaction throughput. I don't know if that's really transaction throughput's the best way to go with MakerDAO, but let's just say for argument's sake, you have higher transactions per second potentially. But you know, a year, two, three years from now, whatever ecosystem is built on top of MakerDAO with a whole intertwined decentralized finance ecosystem that's built that will always be subject to not only MakerDAO's governance, but the governance of the 21 block producers on EOS, which is a huge concern. Yeah, you then have to scale. Yeah, exactly. You're not, you know, people are thinking short-term about scale of products. It's very dangerous when they don't think long-term about the governance of the products as well. We're like, you know, that's when you evaluate your tax service. You know, we're thinking 10 years down the line, will <clears throat> Ethereum's governance change in a proof of stake system? Because right now, Ethereum just adheres to a basic off-chain governance system of both miners and node signaling. Versus, should I build this on EOS where I have to make sure that the block producers who are being elected are cool with my entire financial ecosystem built on top of EOS? And just to, to add on one thing, you know, using the shopping mall because it's an easy to digest metaphor. Um, so take a brand like Macy's. If the shopping mall burns down in deep Brooklyn, which is actually what happened, <laughs> people are still going to love Macy's as a brand. And Macy's will just move the store to a different location. And I think that's something that's going to happen, and which is why I love interoperability plays, is that a lot of these projects need to be mindful. What happens if Ethereum's vision of governance and the way the whole project is run eventually doesn't line up with your business ethos? You need to have adaptability. Again, this is just looking at it as a business person. You need to plan that. Or what if the new shiny kid comes out? What if someone in brings out a blockchain that's fully decentralized and can do a gajillion transactions per second, but no one knows about it yet because it hasn't been invented. Yeah. And, and as Jake mentioned, the um, the shopping mall thing, he was talking about it burning down. It was actually a, a real case. Um, so I'm, I'm originally from the south end of Brooklyn and there's a mall down there called King's Plaza. And this kind of clicked for me about the mall burning down because recently there was a massive fire in King's Plaza's parking lot, just like charred the entire inside of it. And then I was like, wait, you know, what happens if the malls burns the mall burns down and all the stores inside and then eventually kind of led to these analogies? That's interesting. So one question on that, like let's take it a step further further. Let's say Macy's has a token and the shopping mall is Ethereum. Let's say Ethereum fails to deliver and Macy's wants to ship uh, you know, switch to another platform. Let's just say EOS for argument's sake. Let's say Macy's also has a token. Wouldn't it be better to own the Macy's token because that's gonna be the successful thing than Ethereum in this case? I know it's a very specific question. So yeah, and I think this, this moves back to the FAT protocol thesis. Um, personally, I'm not a believer in the FAT protocol thesis. I don't think that you're going to have this massive, massive value capture at the base. I think the application, like I talked about earlier, like the relayers on 0x, 
I think all the massive value capture is still going to occur at the very top of the chain with all these applications that are capturing value. And just expanding on that, I, I still struggle with this, but I'm leaning more and more towards, I'm probably going to get a lot of flack for it. I see Ethereum more and more as almost a commodity and the commodity is security of the network. And I think now if Ethereum becomes the true monopoly world computer and controls everything, like we only have one internet, then I would argue that it will capture some of that accrued value of everything built on top down at the base level. But it is also very unlikely that Ethereum is going to be the de facto 100% monopoly around the world. So knowing that, it means security becomes commoditized. And that's why I think it's going to be a hard case to argue that more of the value won't be captured above the base protocol. But again, the aggregate security of Ethereum has 80% market share. That security is going to be much higher than Jake's new chain, which has you know one tera hash power. So it's it's still going to have some inherent value, but I don't think it's going to capture a majority unless it gets total control. That's yeah, that's definitely interesting, and I promise I won't tell Joe Lubin what you guys just said. <laughs> 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 I can't stop him from listening to it, but I doubt he is. But let, let's go let's go back to uh, like square one here. You know, what are your guys' take on? I guess, security tokens. I mean, I've had on a lot of the founders of a lot of security platforms like Polymath and Harbor, and uh, I've also had your own Andrew Keys on from Token Foundry as well. You know, what are your take on security tokens? In my mind, it's it solves some pain points on reducing liquidity premiums for real assets, but I don't really see it as a viral use case for crypto, but I don't know. Yeah, so perfectly frank, I like security tokens. I think as they exist in a vanilla translation of what we already have, they're not that much better. Like you said, they they give a liquidity premium. So if I buy into a startup, I don't have to wait five to 10 years for an exit event. I think that's really valuable. But otherwise, they're kind of boring and they've already been done. Where they get really interesting, and this is kind of high in the sky, make-believe land, is where you start allowing some of these microservices to be broken up. So I, I've been using this, this uh, analogy of if I own a bunch of vending machines, each of those vending machines is unique in time and space. So they can be represented by an NFT. And I own those machines, but I'm not that good at repairing the machines. I'm actually better at sourcing and stocking delicious snacks. That's really why people come to the vending machines. I know where to place them and I know how to stock them with the best of the best snacks. So what if I could sell those as a depreciating asset off my balance sheet to someone that specializes exclusively in maintaining and servicing vending machines? And then they get a rent from me. I own in perpetuity the control of the snack slots and I can stock them and focus on what I'm good at. And he can focus, he, she, they can focus on what they're good at, which is fixing the machines. All of a sudden, if you extrapolate that, you could take a business and break it down into infinitesimal pieces where I, so this is kind of getting hand wavy and philosophical. I, I firmly believe that businesses overall over time are going to be hyper generalized or hyper specialized. And anyone that's in the middle is going to get crushed. So Caterpillar makes a lot of construction equipment, but if there's someone like a Mack truck that only makes trucks, their trucks are always going to be better than Caterpillar's trucks. Why? Because they're hyper specialized on trucks. And then you can hyper specialize even further, like you've seen with cars, the Hemi engine. No one really cares about the vehicle surrounding it anymore, as long as it's got that Hemi engine. So we, we go back and forth on our team about this a lot. That's where security tokens, in my mind, get really powerful, or I'm going to use the buzzword and I hate it, unbundling of businesses and services. That's where those could be extremely amazing because you can hyper-focus on what you're interested in and you get like a portion of future revenues through those security tokens. No, that, that's interesting. I mean, we're seeing an unbundling in other areas too. I mean, we're seeing like content come off of the networks. Now you have Netflix and now you can get internet without having to go with the triple play. So, I mean, unbundling definitely has its has its uh, use case. Yeah, and that also deals with like, you know, the, the hyper creation of all these different services and offerings. Like we've kind of come full circle back to, hey, I only, I only want these specific five, not the whole plate of 200, so to speak. Yeah, no, that, that's super interesting. Well, Rocco, let's go on to some of, I'm sure Jacob has some comments on it, but let's go on to some of your posts because I know you, you write some great posts on Medium. I wanted to talk about one of your posts in particular, the death of decentralization. 
Just walk us through your your thesis on this Medium post. And for those who are looking for Rocco, you can just search Rocco Medium. Um, it's actually under the Alpine tag on Medium as well. So <laughs> this was actually probably one of the funnest posts that I, I, I wrote that I think. Um, it, was, it was heavily inspired. And Nick Carter put out a post called Blockchain is Semantic Wasteland, where it was like, you know, let's stop using the word blockchain. It, it's become it's 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 value. It's it's been reduced. It doesn't even know what it is anymore. Which kind of inspired me. I'm like, hey, you know what else is used pretty often? <laughs> Decentralization as like a buzzword. And what I tried to do in the post was break it down into a couple of pillars. Now, the first pillar being censorship, resistance, and immutability. This dealt with like, hey, how how likely or how easy it is for a nation state or as Jake mentioned, like someone like deciding, oh, I'm gonna just attack this network because I'm sitting on a ton of capital today. Like how resilient it is to these attacks. Um and also like, am I gonna be censored in transacting on this network? What is the likelihood? So just measure it. I wanted to take decentralization, move it to sort sort of the spectrum that's contained within these multiple elements. Um also like social engineering attacks fall into this as well. The second pillar in this case was uh, verifiability. Um, in this case, is is everything open source and auditable? Can everyone see all the code? Or is, is anything being hidden? Like, I believe Tron recently was hiding like some of the super representative uh, code and the block reward code. Someone like mentioned, I remember on Twitter, it was like, oh, we can't even, we don't even know what Tron's block reward is. Like, is it all being done in secret or these networks are actually open source and verifiable? I know when I run a Bitcoin node that I could see all the code that's involved with Bitcoin Core. Like, it's all there for me to see. Um, and a lot of this I kind of pushed back on, on Ripple a bit um, because Ripple actually has 32,570 blocks missing. Uh, so it all starts there for Ripple. You don't even have an entire history uh, talking about the verifiability end. Next is accessibility. Um, can I actually run nodes for these networks? What is a user's level of accessibility on these networks in terms of like governing, so to speak? Um, I pointed, I think, towards the EOS constitution here. like. I have to make sure that I abide by these rules. Why can't I just set my own rules in this decentralized system? Uh, are there leaders? And lastly, is the idea of social consensus. Um, is there a foundation? Does your blockchain have a Justin Sun? Uh, we have you know, these. Are, these are all attack vectors in, the, in these networks. And like decentralization as a word, it's just a combination of all these factors, not just like this blanket decentralization. Like I wouldn't call that decentralized. Like. Augur's, uh, Augur removing the big red button was a step towards decentralization. Uh, something might not just be generally decentralized, period. Um, I like thinking of these systems as like trustless. And lastly, I, I think I went also into like everyone calling DEX, like using the word DEX, when most DEXs out there are decentralized exchanges, so to speak, are really just non-custodial. Uh, but that was kind of the basis of that post, kind of breaking it down, talking about what the pillars were, and seeing decentralization as like just a spectrum rather than this binary blanket one term fits all uh, marketing for us. That's interesting. So I guess a question for both of you building off of this post, I'm not sure who wants to take this one, but when you guys are looking to design tokens, you know, how do you actually design for is every like do you guys design everything to be decentralized? Like the number of accounts holding the money supply has to be decentralized. The number of client code base have to be decentralized. The nodes, how do you guys think about designing decentralization across all of these vectors? So that's, um, no, we start with the assumption, again, if you have users and revenue, you're going to be heavily centralized. And this is, this is something we talk about all the time is blockchain or projects or whatever, they need to be incubated. You can't just take a baby chick freshly hatched and throw it off a building. It's probably not going to survive for very long. You have to give it a chance to grow, bump its head a few times, like learn how to be a bird so it can actually go fly. Um, kind of a cheesy metaphor, I guess, but the reality is you can't just say decentralization and push it and just hope to God it doesn't screw up because this is something new. We're all bumping around in the dark with flashlights and anyone who claims anything with finality of like, this is going to be how it is, is an idiot. And, or maybe I'm the idiot and they can see the future, but we generally <laughs> take projects. So like an example of something I'm working on is my, my cousin's a competitive World of Warcraft player. And he's been playing it and is sponsored by Blizzard. He's been playing it for over a decade. And playing in the economics of it, I'm working on a concept white paper of like what would happen if Blizzard were to completely decentralize World of Warcraft. They never will because they're making way too much money. But if they were, 
how would you start something like that? And so some of the things are, okay, first you want to do things that are not going to impact the core system. So basically you don't want players to make weapons or items that influence attributes of the game because it makes the game too easy or too hard. So you start with things like silly hats, things that are cosmetic items. Maybe you allow new skins or you allow customization of the audio, things that aren't going to impact the base level of the gameplay. And you create marketplaces around there, going back to the Amazon or the insided marketplaces. We look at all the pieces of a business and you want to start with the lower impact things first, where you can basically, if it screws up, it's not going to completely destroy the whole network and you have to start from zero. The other thing is we highly recommend a lot of times, even though I know everyone hates the big red button existing for Bancor or Augur or all these other companies, you need to allow an escape hatch so you can go in and like fix the system if it's completely broken. Now, that requires trust, which is the whole name of the game, that over time you won't be a jerk and hide that button for yourself, You know, like the turbo boost from Jihan Wu with his mining. He may or may not use it, but no one knows. Um, so that's, that's generally how we have these conversations with enterprise. We're not saying, yo, jump into the deep end, full blockchain, give up total control. It's going to work out great. We say, why don't you do a few things in parallel and see what does or doesn't work, where if it fails, your $100 billion market cap doesn't get erased. Yeah, never go full blockchain. <laughs> it's a good quote. So you know, how do you guys think about the cultural aspect of the centralization. I'm guessing with enterprise, there's always going to be like a leader of the company, a CEO, et cetera. But are you guys fans of blockchains that have a leader, like have a Vitalik Buterin on Ethereum or, or you know, no leader like Bitcoin with Satoshi? It's just, you know, potentially an idea. We don't know who it is. So, so on my end, um, personally, I'm, not, I'm definitely not going to speak for Jacob. Jacob will probably follow. Um, I personally am not a fan of blockchains with leaders. Um, so you have cases like Bitcoin, you have cases like Monero, where you can't point to us. There's, there's no flag following, essentially. And then it's basically left up to the consensus of users um, or nodes to make decisions about the protocol and, and really lead the protocol. Like, I, I kind of laugh at anything where Satoshi is mentioned in as like, as like a profit. Um, because at the end of the day, it's still up to the users. Like, we don't, we don't go to Monero and, and talk about Nicholas van Saberhagen's vision. Uh, like it'd be laughed off as a joke. And that's, that's, and that's the beauty of like, when I, when I talk about decentralization, like that's what I think of like as the closest to being decentralized is not having these leaders to flag follow. You'll obviously have natural hierarchies and people who can disseminate information that I might not even understand. Um, and we were able to choose these leaders as we, as we wish. There is no like creator of the protocol. In this case, that's like a natural leader, so to speak. And so I... I'm on the other side a little bit that I think not having a lightning rod figure slowed the adoption of Bitcoin down a little bit. And the reason I say that is I don't necessarily agree that like the problem with Vitalik as an example is if he were to get hit by a bus tomorrow, unfortunately, Ethereum's price would suffer because he's too strong of a, of a figurehead. But that being said, Fluffy Pony has chosen to take on being a vocal figurehead of Monero for the same reason that Vitalik is in a way that it adds a sense of credibility that it's not some anarchistic, dark web, you know, sex slavery, drug ring thing. It adds a little bit of credibility to it. That being said, though, there has to be a path forward of how you slowly give that control up and milestones that actually get hit. And I think Vitalik is actually trying to do that. We can get into the semantics of if that's the right way, the best way or not. But I, I like the idea, especially if we're talking about enterprises, a bunch of retail consumers have a lower likelihood, in my opinion, of making blockchain achieve mass adoption because no one wants to go and do the work for free except for a select minority. And those people have done great work. But the reality is, as we live and breathe today, we need financial structures that allow people to work on it full time and in a meaningful way without distraction. And that's paid for by fiat today. And also to quickly explain to to, to listeners uh, with Fluffy Pony, it's Ricardo Spadney was um, <laughs> one of the original, um, for those that know, uh, Monero is actually a fork of BitMonero, which was created in 2014 by someone named Thankful for Today on Bitcoin Talk. Uh, Ricardo and a group, of, I think it was a group of six, actually forked Monero. And to this day, Ricardo has been the lead maintainer. And I think he's also in the process of stepping back. Yeah, no, I'm a shameless plug here. I'm working on my privacy coin report and it is 
not an easy one to do, but I'm sure you guys know that, but, you know, getting back to your point, Jacob, on the leader and the figureheads, I mean, there's a lot of teams that are popping up. Like I had the near protocol team on and they're basically arguing, uh, they're doing some great work. They, they publish a lot of great research, but they're basically arguing that a centralized team where, you know, really smart people are all in the same room can build faster than obviously a globally distributed team where everybody has different, you know, ideas. But my take here is that if we don't have a pathway to decentralization, then there's no point to have crypto or blockchain at all. And we just shouldn't have it. So I'm wondering what your guys' take there is. So I, I completely agree. And, you know, the whole name of this game is being built on trust. And listen, I love what Coinbase is doing. You can't knock them. They're top-down command control structure, but they deliver. Same with Circle. Every week, every month, every quarter, they're executing, releasing products and making impact. And they've made uh, blockchain so easy. My mother can swipe her credit card and buy one of those Ethereums. And she doesn't know how it works, but it works. And that has a lot of value of getting people onboarded. But if we're really trying to achieve this vision of decentralization and uh, shared resources and infrastructure, there has to be groups that step back. And I do believe this is, you know, the, the pragmatic optimist in me, I guess. I think there will be some that see mountains of money and say, ah, I don't really feel like giving up control. But there will also be certain groups that do step back and give up that control. And that's how we got something like Linux, completely open source platform that runs, what is it, like 80% of enterprise backend now. And then you have service providers who have built on top of it that charge money. They're like, oh, you don't want to deal with the hardcore tech stuff. Well, if you pay us a fee, we'll help you implement it. But Linux is a perfect example of the open source ethos that works. And I think it'll take a few people stepping back and they will have such a meaningful impact that it'll probably force other people's hands. That's interesting. So um, I hate to think in this extreme because I like Ethereum, but if Ethereum is commoditized, it sounds like in this scenario, consensus would be the systems integrator or the IBM or the Microsoft building on top of the internet, which would be Ethereum in that way. I mean, to be perfectly frank, that's one of the pillars of consensus all as it is. The group's called Solutions, and that's exactly what they do is they help enterprise level clients look at and implement from a technical standpoint. We have things like Pegasus, which is releasing Pantheon. I mean, that's not a bad thing. And Ethereum going to a commodity, if that's the way it goes, I don't view that as a bad thing. You need something to run this security layer. It can't be for free or else we'll just get a bunch of spam attacks. Yeah, no, that's interesting. So I want to switch gears a little bit back to the infrastructure layer because that was really interesting. I mean, how do you guys think about building on Bitcoin? I know um, Blockstack is really big about building on Bitcoin. Obviously, they're like one of the only ones I could point to here. Um, what's your take on building on Bitcoin? Because in my mind, it seems safer from a you know protocol standpoint because it's not as many chains as Ethereum, but obviously it's not a very good scripting language. Um, in terms of building on Bitcoin, I'm actually personally very, very curious and, and watching it all unfold. It's actually great to see um, for those that don't know, there's a lot going on both on the Lightning end in terms of uh, opening up channels and making payments very easy to even side chains with uh, Blockstream and their liquid side chain. So there's a lot of development also going on with Bitcoin. Um, and I think it's going to boil down to like who's capturing hearts and minds in this space. Again, it comes down to a lot to social sentiment. Uh, who's going to adopt it first? Because we could all keep screaming in silos um, in this space. The, the funnest thing about the space is like going to conferences and, and realizing that like we're, we're still in a vacuum. Like you go to a blockchain conference and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, blockchain, rah, rah, save the world. And then you go to a tech conference and then you're kind of the, the small fish in the big pond. It's a great thing to see. And I think uh, I, I'm personally a fan of uh, everything that's being built on Bitcoin and people who are building sidechain solutions and, and, and those who are building Lightning Network. Um, again, it just boils down to who's going to get the lion's share of developers and who's going to get the lion's share of people actually using the damn thing. A lot of yeah. this, unfortunately, is hearts and minds. Not The best tech won't always win. It's who screams the loud enough, who screams loud enough and gets enough mind share. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. I guess just getting the developers, though, I mean, other than following Jimmy Song on Twitter with him screaming about people building on Bitcoin, I don't see anybody building on it. Hey, are, are, are you worthy 
of holding BTC. <laughs> Are you worthy of holding BTC now? Is... I, I guess I'll have to ask him, right? <laughs> yeah, man. That, that's, and that's what I'm saying too. Like it also comes down to like social sentiment. I, and another joke is like toxic Bitcoiners. And I don't think they're toxic. I think they're just very like passionate about Bitcoin. But like, I think I talked about this, uh, the other day where like calling, you know, uh, vouching for Bitcoin and calling everything else a scam is like trying to convert someone's religion and calling their profit like, like a con artist. Like you don't, you're not going to convert an evangelical by by saying like Jesus was was a con <laughs> was a con artist. And yeah, it, again, and, and it boils down to like again hearts and minds. How do you capture the people to like really believe in what in what you believe in at that same level of passion? <laughs> and, yeah. No, no, and, that's that's interesting. Sorry, Jacob. Go ahead. No, and that's why I honestly love the bear market currently. Like, yeah, I wish I had my moonish Lambo to drive around in right now, but it gets a lot of the people that were in this for the wrong reason or the purely toxic people out of the ecosystem and the people that are actually building. Listen, I don't care if Bitcoin or EOS or Cardano or any of them win. Whoever wins makes everything better. And the fact that there's a lot of competition, I would argue, is actually the best thing about this space. And it's inevitable. You never, you see this in every industry from all time is it's always going to consolidate around an oligopoly of a few. It just, it's the case. It's too hard for a developer to develop the same code base across 15 operating systems. It's exhausting. It's part of the reason that Microsoft's mobile phone operating system died out. They just were a little too late and couldn't get enough mind share. And developers didn't want to do an app the third time over on a new code base. So it, the biggest thing is people need to stop. I, again, me being the pragmatic person I am, stop screaming and just prove me wrong by de- delivering tech and making it work. Yeah, and, no, that's interesting. Oh yeah, one of the, I, try, I love to think about the space is like the greatest combination of finance, technology, drama, and comedy. Mm-hmm. And the the other good thing about the bear market is not just like you know all the scammers that you met in 2017 got washed out, but also the fact that places like Twitter now look like those soft flats in Bolivia. <laughs> <laughs> So it's always just fantastic to watch. No, that that's interesting. So not to totally change gears, but I have another question on on the governance idea here. On we were talking about MakerDAO and ZeroX before, and you know there are roadmaps where you know eventually you could vote on protocols or changes. Well, I mean, you're you could already vote on changes on MakerDAO with your tokens. But do you guys really think that people buying? I, I'm sure I probably already know the answer, but do you guys think that people buying tokens where it's one token, one vote? are actually going to sit by their computer every Saturday morning and vote on changes? Or do you think something like, you know, the proof of stake method, like with Ethereum or even what Tezos has right now is better? Oh, well, Ethereum I, I, was. I definitely say the, the one token, one vote, God, no. Um, we've seen this with the carbon vote in Ethereum when the DAO happened. We're seeing it now even with projects with token votes. So take like Aragon, for example, recently had a vote on the AGP1 proposal. You had like 44 out of 20,000 plus addresses uh, contribute and, and it only represented some small amount of the assets. And even Maker's foundational vote, you had maybe, I think, four addresses that were like three quarters of the actual voting percentage. And we've even talked about this in, in like TCRs when we think about like the ad chain being one of them, how it costs very little to actually attack these networks because of how weak the turnout was. Um, the one thing I have noticed though is when you couple kind of voting with uh, work for a network, so like take Decred for example. Um, in their Politeia system, in order to get tickets to vote in Decred, you actually have to be a staker in Decred. You have to work for the network and provide a service for the network and validate those blocks. And in doing so, you get tickets to vote. And they had pretty solid turnout rates from what I remember, um, that percentage. So you're going to see more experimentation. But as for the whole one token, one vote system, I'm glad to see everyone thinking around how to modify governance, even if it's on a second layer. Obviously, we talked about earlier with base layer governance. You know, If it's being shaky, it's going to shake up a second layer. But people were thinking creatively about voting. I'm a fan of. But at the end of the day, I'm still just a larger fan of off-chain um, governance where you don't necessarily need the asset, uh, just need to be a full node in order that's, to govern, per se. That's interesting. So I guess taking Ethereum as an example, like how do you view like a perfect um, voting world or cultural world around Ethereum like five years from now or something? Because it seems like the off-chain governance where you know the community decides is great, but it seems like we also have this somewhat creative discourse between things like we have Ethereum 1.x that popped up recently as well. So uh, Rocco is our in-house specialist on governance, but in general governance, 
The problem is it always comes back to human subjectivity. And when it comes to human beings, we're kind of the best and kind of the worst at everything. So governance at the end of the day will always come down to like trying to push wet spaghetti through a pipe. It just nothing we've never we haven't discovered the perfect way to govern ourselves in the real world. So we're not going to ever come up with the best way to do it on the dry space of code. And there's a lot of little things that we're playing with, like quadratic voting or the delegated proof of stake and things like that. But in general, I would argue that governance might be one of the hardest and also still TBD to solve. Um, and, and for me, kind of one of the, I know on-chain governance has been kind of the, the, hot, the hot buzzword with a couple of projects looking to implement it. I know Polkadot's on it, ES is on it, Decred and, and Tezos too. And what I'm curious actually is, um, Tezos has been thinking a little out of the box. And I think they mentioned where um, they were going to potentially implement Futurarchy, which deals with like kind of voting on where we're going, but betting on how to get there. So opening up like markets uh, <laughs> to bet to bet on how you know decisions are you know, are implemented. So it's, it's, it's again like thinking about creative ways to um, basically create and deploy governance processes, and also the yeah. mechanisms by which things are governed. So like, what does the interfaces for governance look like? How is it done? You know how how does like maker part of makers vote was like creating UX tools to to help users who might not know really how to do it if it was too technical or Aragon too, which is making like DAOs as a service and, and trying to create these great interfaces for users to be able to, to, to work on um, where off-chain governance affords users this, you know, free floating thing where, you know, as a node, you have the choice of, on, on which software and which rules to run. But when it's on-chain and it deals with the asset, you have a lot more, um, f- you know, friction in terms of like, how do we get people to vote and where are they going to vote? And what are these systems going to look like? Yeah, no, that's interesting. I put out a Tezos deep dive too. I just actually tweeted it just now and somebody like took an issue with it. And I'm kind of explaining that, you know, we're so early in this space, we can't decide absolute winners or losers yet. And I really do like what Tezos is doing where you could delegate your votes because in Ethereum with Serenity, like I would love to, and this is probably the idea what they're going for, but I would love to stake my votes behind like, let's say Vlad and Vitalik um, I don't want to sit there every Saturday morning at 5 a.m. to vote on, you know, an EIP. <laughs> well, and that's, uh, I know Rocco's got something to say, but that's, that's kind of the whole issue. I mean, we see this in real life voting as well. Information asymmetry, you have people blindly voting on information without actually knowing or voting on process without actually knowing the information behind it or the values. And I, I believe that's, I think it's going to be a mix of everything. Like if you're a well-informed consumer, sure, you should actively be voting voting on the things you're passionate about. If you're a lazy couch potato, that's not wrong either. It's your choice, but delegate it to someone that you trust. And yeah, also, that's a good point. And also seeing like kind of the, with, with the whole delegation thing, we talked about Tezos and bakers. Um, there's kind of a low threshold to be a baker, which is nice, but at the same time, like these large baking operations, Tezos has managed to keep, so far, the validator set pretty stretchy because... Um, basically, if these large delegators, if they can't promise the competitive returns to people delegating to them, they end up saying, hey, you know, stop delegating to us. We've reached our, our kind of threshold, forcing people to delegate to other bakers and thereby stretching the validator set to be a little wider. Um, so it's also created these competitive market environments in which every baker is trying to offer the best returns and, setting, and self-policing and setting their own thresholds in order to keep the validator set stretchy and make sure they can promise the best returns for the people delegating to them. So there's forcing users to say, hey, you know, we can't take any more people delegating to us, go to another baker, and, and thereby that ends up actually stretching the validator set. Yeah, that's super interesting. I mean, in my Tezos report, I kind of touched on that. I, I, I kind of wrestle with that a little bit because if you have inflation, if you have high inflation, you're rewarding the miners, which is great, but then you're potentially overpaying for security. So like that's definitely a trade-off people are gonna have to look to when they look for like Serenity versus staking and or Serenity versus Tezos in like a proof of stake world. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. So let's go on, Rocco. You have a great post also on futility tokens, which kind of rounds out our conversation here. So give us your thesis on futility tokens. And for those listening, it's it's also on uh, Rocco's Medium. Yeah, so I guess this makes a good way to kind of round it out because like what happens to tokens if they fail to effectively capture value? It's good, because, especially with this 2017 market, and leading into 2018, kind of crashing everything, we've seen pro- projects literally capitulate. Um, so the utility token thing was on where do these projects go if their tokens 
effectively fail to capture value and how do they also control the narrative? So take, so the, the post featured four projects, it was Mercury Protocol, Economy, Digipulse and Co-Founded. And just using Co-Founded as one of the examples, they still had money in their treasury. Um, they basically refunded all the tokens and said, hey, we're going to go out in this phase of creative destruction. Like we see where the market's going and we're going to do this great thing to end it all on a very, very happy note. When in reality, it was just an unsustainable business model to begin with. But by doing so and having this kind of creative destruction, quote unquote, that they, that they pinned in their posts, they're able to control the narrative and have this nice exit. Same as the case with like economy. They're like, okay, we're going to convert the tokens to equity. Like, you know, so these measurable values instead of having this like convoluted burning system. Um, I think Digipulse also was like a payment token and only like two people out of the hundreds that use the service actually use the payment token. And it was completely illiquid. And again, they also converted it to equity. So they're basically looking to control the narrative in that case. But it's, it's, it's great to watch. And then, and then you also might have tokens that, that change their model. So in the summer, um, Civic, for example, changed their model from just the payment token to create this like game theoretic staking system. I'm like still not a fan of it, but it's great to see these creative like new ways in which products are thinking about capturing value are coming up. But then you might also have the futility example where these products realize, hey, this was a crappy idea to begin with. We should just kind of figure out our exit and try not to burn people on the way out. I'm, I'm glad to see they're trying not to burn a lot of people on the way out, like either through an equity conversion or like refunding. But I think time will tell and you'll have a lot more projects start to enter this phase of like being accepting their fate as a futility token and the projects themselves capitulating. But obviously a lot of it comes down to narrative control. That's interesting. So I have to ask you guys to round it out even more. I mean, what, um, what qualitatively would you guys think would signal somewhat towards the bottom? I mean, in my mind, it's two things. It's like ICOs have completely dried up over the past few months, which is one thing, but it's only one use case. And the other thing is, uh, it's probably hits a little close to home, but I saw the consensus email on the reorg. And my take has always been, if consensus had to cut spokes in some sense, then that would absolutely signal the bottom. But you know, what is your guys' take here on you know, where we are currently in the market going into 2019? So the, the new sh- couple things, the new shiny thing of 2019 in our uh, eyes is definitely going to be security tokens. Everyone and their mother is trying to get the first piece of real estate or something similar onto the blockchain. So I think we're going to see a lot of excitement around that. In terms of the utility consumer side, which is most of the tokens and assets being listed on like coin market cap, um, it's hard to know if we're at the bottom or not because the reality is most people are still not using this thing. The most used apps out there are the exchanges, and those are being heavily abused by bots and market makers. So the reality is, I think we just need people to keep their heads down and keep building. And I say that you know very hand wavy because I myself am not a developer. But we need infrastructure, we need scalability, and we need better UI and UX. Like I, I hadn't used my ledger in a couple of months just because I haven't been actively trading and. I was telling the guys that I forgot that it's kind of a pain in the ass to to send money back and forth. I had to figure out what exchanges those assets were on, send my assets from my ledger to those, move those around, pull them back to my ledger. I'd forgotten some of my 2FAs from an old phone, so I had to go turn the old phone on. Like it, It's still not easy to use it. And I think we have just a lot of these hurdles that has to be solved before we worry so much about what the value of the asset actually is. So I, I know that's hand wavy. I don't know if we're at the bottom. It really determines if... No, no, it's it's interesting. I mean, but how do you like... I, I just... It's hard to think in extremes for me because a lot of people are saying, you know, a few weeks ago, I was following Twitter closely and it's, you know, Bitcoin's bottom is 3,000. So in my mind, like, we'll never actually hit that bottom. We'll go, you know, land somewhere above it. That's not investment advice and it's obviously changed. But my point is like, we can't... I just don't know if we're going to get to a world where like every potentially bad product is just completely bankrupt. Like I don't, I don't uh-huh. know if we need the OS to go bankrupt for crypto to be successful. I, and I, and I don't think it's going to take this like magic idea of like every project capitulating and then we have the bottom. I, I, I think honestly, it'll just be a, a multitude of factors that are just general signals that we're on the way down, and it'll take one sweeping wave to just bring the market back up. 
Personally, I like using like Tron totally capitulating as an indicator, but that's just a joke. And again, not financial <laughs> advice, of course. Uh, but like, uh, as Jacob mentioned, like we could have our ideas, but I don't think there's like the pinpoint indicator. Like, I don't think all projects that I see out are going to capitulate. I don't think all tokens are going to go to zero. Like, I hate these ideas of finality because I just don't think they're going to happen. And I think they're a little ridiculous. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so another question for you guys. Let's say we had Ethereum Serenity upgrade tomorrow. Like, let's say all of the benefits are there. We have sharding and we have, let's say, even plasma work just for the hell of it. Like, do you guys think that that would actually change the tide of the market? Or do you think that it really wouldn't because we still wouldn't have killer use cases? We would just have a killer infrastructure layer. I don't think it would be a light switch event where if they released it tomorrow, all of a sudden the value will actually, I guess the value would go up because of speculation. But knowing that the infrastructure was there would allow people to build. So one of the things I always laugh at is the decentralized version of Twitter. It's ex very expensive and really slow and hard as hell to use. Come on down and sign up. It's like, that sounds like a terrible use case. Um, I think it would open up the door to value creation because projects could actually scale in a meaningful way. Again, going back to the joke and all the memes that came out with CryptoKitties, while it was popular, it completely destroyed the ecosystem. You couldn't, like, Ethereum wasn't functioning anymore because too many people were buying and selling and trading cats. Yeah, no, that, that's a really good point. It's just, you know, I feel like a lot of the future of crypto, like people look at what we have now, but I think in reality, people are really betting on what we're going to have. And like, I always wrestle with that. Like, think about Ethereum Serenity when I did that report. Like, I think people have to remember that we're not comparing Ethereum today to like Tezos or EOS. We're comparing like Serenity to where Tezos is going to be in a year versus, you know, potentially new protocols that roll out. Yeah, exactly. Wider landscape environments in that case. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, guys, is there anything that we haven't talked about? I mean, this has been one of my favorite podcasts so far, so I want to make sure we didn't miss anything. I, th I think I think we're all good from our end. Uh, Jake, is there anything else you want to talk about too on the token side or anything? No, uh, this was this was a lot of fun. Uh, just kind of walking through what we do. Like I said, we honestly a lot of this we make up as we go along. We've just re maybe read more white papers and spend more time. But a lot of this is just figuring out how it's actually going to impact ourselves, the world, companies, etc. I know that sounds very high in the sky, but if we can ever get there, I think it could be really impactful. We just need to accept a lot of the shortcomings along the way. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Well, I'm going to be, I'm going to look forward to having you guys back on so we could discuss Serenity when we get closer and, and other things, but I really appreciate your time. Yeah, man, I'd love to. Thanks again for having us. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Please rate and review the podcast to help other people find it and visit 51pct.io and use coupon code TOKEN to get 20% off any subscription before this offer ends in now 23 hours.